weeks ago, we began a midsummer study series based on 2 Corinthians, one of two New Testament letters written by the Apostle Paul to a church he planted on his second missionary journey. Y'all know that, right? All y'all know that by now. But for those who have missed some of the messages in this series or those just joining us, I encourage you once again to take advantage of the recorded live streams on our YouTube channel. And while those messages contain essential context for getting the most out of this study, for those just joining us today, I want to briefly give you enough information to help you get started. A year after Paul left Corinth to continue his gospel mission in other towns and cities, he learned that several divisions had erupted among the members of the Corinthian church relating to personal preferences for a particular church leader. I'm going to turn that down a little bit because i got a little squeal going on. That should take care of it. The appearance of these factions caused divisive arguments that swelled to the point that worship and fellowship gatherings became little more than chaotic assemblies. In addition, some of the church had returned to sins of the flesh, characteristic of their former pagan lifestyle. In response, Paul took several steps to address these issues, writing three letters and making a rather unpleasant surprise visit. Those actions brought about a swarm of rebellious, character-assassinating criticism that questioned Paul's authority and identity as a genuine apostle of the Lord Jesus. And the good news is, is that by the time Paul wrote this letter, 2 Corinthians, most believers in Corinth had repented and they were taking steps to restore their broken relationship with Paul. Nonetheless, Paul felt it was still appropriate to defend his ministry. Now, as we've talked about before, while the Bible is separated into chapters and verses to help us more easily locate specific passages, the first seven chapters of 2 Corinthians must be viewed as an ongoing dialogue representing Paul's defense of his ministry. So with that in mind, today's message centers on 2 Corinthians chapter 6. However, since I've just stated that the first seven chapters of 2 Corinthians are one continuous train of thought, I'd like to begin this morning by reading the last section of chapter 5, which was our central scripture in last week's message. Beginning in uh, chapter 5, verse 11, Paul writes, because we understand our fearful, fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we're crazy... It is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against him. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Amen. 
As we approach today's message, I want to take you back to verse 13 of this passage we've just read. Again, verse 13 says, If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. As the Apostle Paul traveled around the Roman Empire, New Testament scripture reveals that he was frequently accused of being crazy. People heard his testimony concerning his life-changing supernatural encounter with the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road, and they assumed he was a nut job. After leaving Ephesus, Paul went to Jerusalem, and his testimony caused such a stir among the Jewish Sanhedrin that a riot broke out upon which the Roman authorities subsequently arrested him. And then shortly after that, after learning of an assassination plot by the Sanhedrin, the Romans whisked Paul away to Caesarea, where he remained under protective custody for the next two years while the authorities tried to figure out what to do with him. Felix, the governor in charge at the time, believed Paul was innocent, but nonetheless, he kept postponing Paul's release and trial to, to keep peace with the Jewish authorities. And after a man named Festus replaced Felix as governor, Paul's trial was placed back on the court's docket. As Festus was listening to Paul's testimony concerning how he met Jesus, Acts 26, 24 tells us that suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. I can relate to Festus. Most weeks by the time I finish preparing my messages, I'm nearly crazy myself. As Bible-believing Christians, Jesus' life on earth provides us with an example to follow as we navigate the, the hazardous conditions of living our redeemed lives in a fallen world. We're called by Scripture to be in the world, not of the world, meaning that we are to be set apart and different from those who live their lives according to the ways of the world. However, any real effort to live that kind of life can look bizarre to those without the Spirit. Still, we're called to walk by faith, not by sight, which in my view includes the sight of others. Essentially, it means we're to trust God and live according to his promises, even when we can't see any tangible evidence that justifies our belief. Pastor Chris, how do I do that? Perhaps the best answer I've ever heard to that question says that you should live in such a way that if you were accused of being a Christian, there would be enough evidence to convict you. What does that kind of life look like? While becoming more like Jesus takes a lifetime, Scripture is full of practical examples that we can follow that help make us different from the world. For instance, in Ephesians 4.32, Paul writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Short little verse, man, it has a big impact on people. In my last secular job, my efforts to do the things in this verse opened the door to many conversations with my co-workers regarding my faith in Jesus. And while that may sound like a good thing, some of those conversations made me the frequent subject of ridicule. For most people, kindness and compassion are, you know, that's pretty easy pill to swallow. However, once you get to the work of the cross, all bets are off. One Monday morning, a young man who was recently promoted to my group from another department asked me what I did over the weekend, and I, I talked about going to church. He says, you're not one of those religious fanatics who believes a dead guy came back to life that, and that somehow saved you, are you? And the truth is, is, his question caught me a bit off guard. However, after a few moments, I nodded and chuckled a little bit and said, well, now that you mention it, I guess I am. While my called role in gospel ministry often comes at a significant cost in terms of old friendships, time to do other things, or rest, I've, I've never felt persecuted for my faith to any measurable degree. However, that wasn't the case for the Apostle Paul, as illustrated later in chapter 11 of this letter. We'll see that in a few weeks, where Paul writes, 
Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. So the typical Jewish punishment was 40 lashes, and they would give people one less than, than, thir than 40, which is 39. I guess, you know, man, they thought maybe that, that last one would it'd kill them. Forty lashes, again, minus one is 39. And if you multiply 39 times five, that's 195 scars Paul carried on his back from public whippings, plus those resulting from multiple beatings with, with heavy rods and hurled stones. Then there were imprisonments, of which the Bible mentions three. According to a, a secular historical document written by Clement, an early church, uh, second century bishop in the Roman church who personally knew the apostles, Paul was actually in prison seven times. These are hard things for the spirit to bear. But Paul didn't quit, and, and that's the point. He hung in there. So with all that in mind, where are we today? Again, today's message centers on the first half of chapter 6, which, con which continues Paul's thoughts in chapter 5, and in the larger picture also continues the seven-chapter defense of his ministry against criticisms, accusations, and efforts to discredit his identity as a genuine apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. That said, for the sake of context, before we look at chapter 6, I want to briefly review, once again, the closing verses in chapter 5, which contains some of the most encouraging, life-changing words ever written. Again, you may recall, because we've just read it, that in chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Paul declares, anyone, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Looking closely at this scripture, we see a, a spiritual before and after photograph like the one you might see in a TV ad for a beauty cream or a weight loss product. Before we trusted Jesus, we were estranged and far away from God, causing us to look for love, joy, peace, and hope in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways. Then after Jesus came into our lives, we who once lived far away from God were brought near to him by the blood of Christ, allowing us to see our lives from God's eternal perspective through nearly open, newly open spiritual eyes of faith. Consequently, our new lives in Christ allow us to experience fulfillment like never before. But as awesome as all that is to think about, it raises two essential questions we must answer. First, having been reconciled and brought near to God, what will we do with our new opportunity? Second, as God's adopted sons and daughters, what will we do in that new relationship? In chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes, As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. Most other modern translations of the New Testament render verse 1 as something like this. It says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. What does it mean to receive God's grace in vain? First, after proclaiming himself, and all other believers as ambassadors for Christ, as he did at the end of chapter 5, Paul opens chapter 6 by describing himself and his protégés as co-workers with God. Some might see this as a bold statement prompting them to ask, how can anybody be a co-worker with God? Of course, the answer to that question is that it can only happen by God's divine appointment. Second, rather than salvation, in this chapter, it, it may be that the phrase God's grace appearing in verse 1 is simply Paul's shorthand way of referring to the gospel and its benefits more specifically, the new creation, reconciliation, 
and the righteousness of God expressed at the end of chapter 5. All these things tie together. This moves us to the more looming question in verse 1, which asks how anyone could receive God's grace in vain. To answer that question, we must first understand what in vain means. Essentially, to say we do something in vain means that whatever we do is done without purpose or result. In context, Paul refers to how the Corinthians responded to the amazing message of grace and hope that he delivered when he first came to Corinth. To a group of men and women who once worshipped lifeless statues and mythical gods, Paul's gospel message was new, it was refreshing, and it was exciting. However, as Paul writes this letter, it's apparent that many in Corinth had yet to allow their lives to be fully transformed by the gift of grace they had openly received. That said, if you or I receive the gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ and don't seize the opportunity to let it transform our lives, we receive it in vain. Likewise, if you're adopted as God's son or daughter, but then you don't live as God's son or daughter, you're not doing anything with the opportunity you've been given. Having wasted spiritual opportunities for many years, I can tell you firsthand that this kind of thing happens to many new believers. As for modern day believers in churches like Ellen Woodhouse Community Church, Paul's words in the opening verses of chapter 6 issue a call to us for authentic ministry. As far as the Corinthians, while Paul consistently addresses his readers as believers in Jesus, It's possible that some of the Corinthians continue to worship pagan idols while participating in church functions, implying that along with Jesus, they also counted on idols to provide their needs. Such practices run against the grain of true dependence and trust in Jesus. Consequently, while those rebelling against Paul's authority You know, they might be making some self-perceived attempts to receive God's grace. They're doing so in vain. While some biblical scholars argue that this chapter indicates that some of Paul's readers weren't genuine believers, in other words, they had not received salvation, I don't see any place in this letter where Paul questions their salvation experience. And while I'm certainly no scholar, perhaps receiving God's grace in vain pertains not so much to salvation as it does to the loss of potential blessings related to spiritual growth, knowledge, and joy. So after studying this scripture over the past week, I believe that the Corinthians in question have genuinely received the salvation of the gospel message. However, they have failed to progress in their spiritual growth, something that we call the process of sanctification. With that shortcoming, they risk missing out on many spiritual blessings and rewards that they might otherwise obtain. The same thing can easily happen to us. Therefore, Paul encourages us to make hay while the sun still shines. That's the underlying message of chapter 6. Now that we've set the table for chapter 6, let's begin with verse 1 again and read through verse 11. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, and this comes from Isaiah, at just the right time I heard you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Paul comes back and says, today is the day of salvation. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, And no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We've been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. 
We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. Oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. Here Paul is obviously writing these words with great passion. But what are we really looking at in this passage? Last week at the end of chapter 5, Paul says that God gave us this ministry of reconciliation. He says that we're ambassadors for Christ and that God speaks through us. In other words, our ministries are opportunities to show the world God's grace, kindness, love, and forgiveness. It goes without saying that to be successful at that, we must live our lives in a certain way. In, in what way? Let's break this passage down into smaller pieces so that we can better understand what Paul is saying. Rereading verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of any kind. Every kind. The first thing Paul says we must do as Christ ambassadors is to live in such a way that no one will stumble because of our words or actions and find fault in our ministry. What does that look like? I want to read these same two versions in the New King James Version. In the New King James Version, verses 3 and 4 are rendered this way. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distress. We live in a culture where taking offense and offending others has become an art form. Judging from what we're seeing recently in, in recent campaign ads and, and media events, taking offense and offending others is a requirement for politicians. Undoubtedly, the gospel itself is highly offensive to many people, so they reject those who bring its message. So does Paul mean we should refrain from sharing the gospel with those who take offense from it? No. Instead, he says that as we share Jesus, we must guard ourselves against taking offense to the point where we respond to criticism, accusations, and attempts to discredit our ministry with behavior that is contrary to the message we bring, creating yet another obstacle between hopelessness and hope. We must share Jesus with an awareness of what we look like to others, not allowing anything in our response to add to their rejection of the gospel to further turn somebody off to Jesus. Some in Corinth, again, they found fault with Paul and they found a whole lot of it. He was accused, again, of being a deceiver, a phony, a false apostle filled with uh, ambition and self-pride. And his point in verses 3 and 4 is that none of these things stuck because his conscience cleared him. He commends himself as a minister of God in other words, he serves others according to the motives and wishes of God's heart rather than his own. I'm going to go back to the NLT, which is where we started this morning, and read verse 4 again. It says, In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. Endure, after studying this, is the key word in this verse. Paul knows that God is pleased and glorified by the fact that he stays the course no matter what happens to him. According to the Greek lexicon that, that I use, the word translated endure refers to patient endurance, steadfastness, or 
essentially holding up under pressure, especially as God enables the believer to remain under the challenges he allots in one's life. Now, I think all of us feel pressure to give in, give up, or go along with things that we don't necessarily agree with. But the mark of a material believer is that he doesn't implode under such pressure. He doesn't quit. In the following few verses, Paul lists some of the pressures of his ministry and, and separates them into three different categories. First, Paul separates men and, and says that he has experienced physical suffering. In the second sentence of verse 4, he refers to these physical sufferings as troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. Second, Paul experienced suffering at the hands of others. In the first half of verse 5, he says, we've been beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs. And finally, Paul also experienced these vocational-related sufferings. In the second half of verse 5, he says he's worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. The hard truth in today's message is, is that if we truly embrace our role in God's ministry of reconciliation, we must also embrace the reality of what it might cost us. In this particular passage, Paul only lists a portion of the many severe hardships he has endured for the sake of the gospel. He narrows it down essentially to beatings, imprisonments, and sleepless nights. Compared to that sneak peek that we took a while ago of chapter 11, Verse 5 is a sugar-coated version of the extreme suffering that Paul actually experienced. Yet as he continues, his words of suffering collide with the overwhelmingly joyful and prosperous spirit that he carries. Listen again to what he says in verse 10. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. So despite the accusations, the criticisms, those assassination attempts on his character and credibility, and more so what Paul's ministry has cost him in terms of personal suffering, Paul remains joyfully full of hope and strength in the eternal promises of God, something he desperately desires for those who brought these unfair and baseless attacks against him. Paul's words teach us that our ministry to share the gospel of Jesus has nothing to do with measurable successes or physical comfort. Instead, it's all about inner transformation of the heart and steadfastness, hanging in there. The bottom line is, is that we must persevere through our challenges, knowing that our strength comes from God. Before we conclude today's service, I want to return to verses 6 and 7 for just a few moments. In God's strength, Paul says that we prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. Here Paul emphasizes the virtues that should characterize both our lives and ministries. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, and the power of the Holy Spirit. These qualities are the markers of a life that aligns with God's will. Our conduct should testify to the truth of the gospel reflecting the integrity and the character of Christ. In all that we do, we're to be honest, genuine, and unwavering in our commitment to God. Reviewing the final three verses of this passage, Paul writes, Oh dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. There's no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I'm asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. Beyond Paul's heart-filled revelation of his deep love and affection for the Corinthians, these verses speak of the power of relationship, the power of relationship. 
Paul longs for those who question his motives to look beyond his human flaws and open their hearts to the message of Jesus Christ just as he has opened his own. He understands that the grace of, of God that brings us into Christ's fellowship with God the Father also brings those who believe into a love-centered relationship with each other, putting an end to personal disdain and conflict. Understanding this relational aspect of God's grace is crucial to our lives and ministry. Faith in Jesus, is, it isn't a solitary journey, but it's one that thrives in community. And in that, guess what? We're called to connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another, reflecting the love and unity that Christ exemplifies. And with that, I will see you guys next time.